scholar of animals, and uh, it became this classification with us. Uh, with, which I would uh, personally say that uh, distance education or education things are slightly different in terms of counseling, otherwise, scenario remains the same. How to, how to achieve this? These courses work there, so on their purposes, but uh, we would have a kind of perspective. Uh, it would be new for all of us, and uh, this is a good book that uh, certainly think in terms of comparative study of what we, see, we have seen in the West and the various travel to the other part of the country. Uh, how would we make some suggestions uh, in that, that we will have to implement? Uh, I think the best course for me would be to have the introduction first of a sector, and uh, that would be followed by his talk and uh, some introduction uh, towards the end of the talk. the introduction, I would invite Kasmin Elseka, who is a cultural affairs specialist at the American Center, and uh, it's because of her efforts that uh, uh, of set this visit and uh, this particular talk being made possible. So I would take this occasion to thank the American Center and Tasneen uh, Kilska uh, in particular and uh, would request her to introduce Setka. Please. Hello, friends. It's my pleasure to be here today. And uh, an honor to be uh, asked to introduce Dr. David Setka and this speaker for today's program. Dr. David Sector is a professor at American University in Washington, D.C., and along with his late wife, Maya Sector, gained a national reputation for work in confronting, confronting gender bias and sexual harassment. He has directed more than a dozen federal education grants, authored five books, and more than 75 articles in journals such as Five Delta Captain. Howard Educational Re Review and Psychology Today. His research and writing document, Sex Bias from the Classroom to the Boardroom. The Sackville's work has been reported in hundreds of newspapers and magazines in the USA. They appeared on local and national television and radio shows, such as the Today Show, Good Morning America, the Author and Fisher Show, and many more. It's my pleasure to have Dr. Sadkar with us here today, and I request him to um, present his uh, presentation on gender equity in education. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to be here, today, and I thank you for listening. And what I'd like to do in the uh, time we have together is really take you on a trip. The trip would be the last that I've had as a researcher and as a teacher and a writer over the last 35 years. But I promise it won't take 35 years for you to take this trip. It'll probably take place in 35 minutes. The way it began in the early 1970s, when my late wife, Mara, and I were both doctoral students at, the, at a university in the States. It was very unusual back then to have a married couple, both being full-time students at a university, putting their doctorates together. This would be unusual today. It was really strange then. But it turned out to be an amazing opportunity, an opportunity to see something we often miss. Mary and I would go to class together. I took you along with, to school with us. And we would sit in the room, and the professor would be teaching. And perhaps I'd have something I'd want to say. So I raised my hand. And the professor would call on me, and I'd answer, and the professor would say, Good job. Mary was more shy. She would raise her hand a lot slower. And when it was finally up, sometimes the professor would call on her, and sometimes the professor would not. And when she did get a chance to speak, the professor would say, Okay. 
I was becoming a star. Very popular in class. Myra had a hard time even having her voice heard. And when we went home after class, she would talk about how it felt not to have a voice in class. We would also write. We wrote articles. We wrote it together. And they were published. Co-authors. David and Myra said that when people talked about our, our, our articles, what they talked about was David's article. And Myra, as you might suspect, became sad and despondent and frustrated. So she had an opportunity to write a column in the school newspaper, and she took it. Her column, her editorial, was about how it felt to be in a program, a graduate program, as a woman who was invisible. The invisible female student. And as luck would have it, one of the people who read that uh, um, editorial was actually a publisher for a major book company. And he said, that's an interesting topic for a book. Would you like to write a book? And I said, sure. So the first book in the United States ever written about what happens to girls in school was written by Maya when she was in graduate school. Uh, school. It was called Sexism in School and Society. And it was written and published in 1973. And we discovered a great American innovation when that book was published. It's called The Royalty Check. People would pay the book, and Meyer would get a royalty check. But I have to tell you, the royalty checks were not very big. And when we asked the publisher to find out why, imagine what, how our sadness when the publisher realized that many people in 1973 did not know the meaning of the word sexism. Meyer's book, Sexism in School and Society was not making sense because the word sexism did not exist in the English language until 1970. Amazing. Hundreds of years, thousands of years of gender bias, and the word sexism was never created. We had a word for bias based on race, based on, on skin color, it was called racism. But sexism was brand new. And you have to wonder why a bias, a form of discrimination based on your gender, did not have a word until 36 years ago. Well, that event, what happened to Maya and I when we went to class, became really life-shaping. We wondered, was what's happening to us in this graduate program, me being recognized, me having a voice, my or not, was that true for everybody? And we began researching across America's schools, elementary or primary schools and secondary schools. We received funds and hired leaders of Jervis to visit over a hundred classrooms in five states in the U.S. and observe how teachers were teaching boys and girls differently. And we discovered some amazing results. Sitting in the same classroom, listening to the same instructor, in the same school, boys and girls were getting two different educations. Boys were speaking out talking about, even acting out, and, ca and causing misbehavior. Girls, on the other hand, were sitting there nice and quietly, smiling, comfortable, the teacher like them. They liked school. Their grades were really good. 
often better than the boys' grades. So it looked as though boys were a problem and girls were doing just fine until you look closer. When you look closer, you realize there's not only the official curriculum of school, where children learn math and reading and writing, but there's also an unofficial curriculum, one that we call the hidden curriculum. Those are the secret lessons that boys and girls learn. In school, boys learn to speak up, even if they get into trouble. Girls learn to quiet down, because that will get them a good grade. As you go through school, boys get more bravado, more confidence. Girls become quieter, losing their voice. So when they graduate school, girls are proud of their good grades, but they paid a terrible price for those grades. The price they paid? Silence, losing their voice, and maybe losing their confidence. Girls, on the other hand, feel entitled, feel as though the world is their oyster, and they nearly have to pick out pearls. They they do have a voice. Now, is this true in India? Is this true that boys develop strength in a voice, girls do not? Well, I've only been here a week, and I've met with teachers in a number of several cities, and I've looked at some classes, and I'd say in many ways, I think it certainly is the case in India. And I hope that people begin researching this in Indian schools because the gender problem in India is more severe and more profound than it ever was in the United States. So to me, as a visitor of India, I see a rich country, I see a, a, an old civilization, I see a country with a growing democracy, and yet I see that country Working into the 21st century with one hand tied behind its back. And that hand is the hand of half the population that's female. And the other hand is doing better, but it's being brought down by poverty. So I see India moving forward, but I know in my heart that if we could free up both hands, if we can take care of poverty, and if we could give women a voice, that India could move forward quicker and that all the people of India could benefit. I truly believe that the universe provides everything people need if they know how to ask for it. So when I look at Indian schools, let me just tell you a few things I saw in my first week. And then we'll have a little um, quiz that I'll share with you about how males and females communicate differently. And we'll uh, take a look at the gender gap in U.S. society and Indian society. Here are some things I see right away when I visit schools. I see the girls in one part of the class and the boys in another part. Two worlds separate. When I work with faculty, with adults, I see the same thing. The men sit somewhere, one place, the women sit in another place. Well, that sounds natural, but then, by race, it would sound very unnatural. If I said, all people with dark skin sit over here, and all people with light skin sit over here, that would seem racist, unfair, and it would have really no educational reason for that. So people don't separate by race. But guess what? The same exact thing applies to gender. If you say for no special reason that we expect females to be over here and males to be over here, then you separate your society. You segregate your society based on something that has nothing to do with education. What I tell people in the States when I see classes that are gender segregated, and some are, 
is to integrate the class, move students around, get some of those girls to sit with boys, get boys to sit with girls, get people to change their seats. Because if you don't, this is what happens. Teachers will go to where the boys are sitting. Boys are more active, more vocal, and also more mischievous. They get into trouble more. So the teacher moves to where the boys are sitting. The girls are left on their own. And so the girls sit quietly, ask for very little, and receive less of the most important thing in any classroom, which is the teacher's time and attention. They are sitting together, draw the teacher as if by a magnet, as though they were a magnet, and the teacher is pulled to them, and the girls get left out. So the first thing we do is integrate classes. And the other thing I do with teachers, and I've been doing it this week in India, is explaining that when you ask a question, it may not be the best or the only approach to call on the first person to raise the hand. Because the first person to raise the hand or to call out is often a man. I ask teachers to wait till five hands are up or ten hands are up and then call on a student to alternate between male and female so that everybody gets a turn. To speak to the quiet students and explain to them that you're going to call on them. You can even tell them the question you're going to ask them. To set the tone in the class where everybody speaks. One of the most important lessons a teacher can teach children is that in this culture, as in any culture, people, adults, people who grow up, children who grow up, and don't have a voice, are less likely to be heard in their own family, are more likely to be abused, and are less likely to get salary raises or promotions in the workplace. One of the things teachers need to teach children, and especially the quiet children, who very often are girls, is to learn how to speak and not be so shy that this weapon, this tool, this gift of voice is lost. But let's have another lesson. It's not the throat, it's the ear. Many boys need to learn how to listen more carefully, at least in the States. I was out of school today, and um, I would ask questions, and the boys would raise their hand. I would tell the boys, all sitting in one section of the room, um, how are you doing? Tell me. Where were you? Okay. Or yes. I'd go over to the girls and I'd say, how are you doing? The silence. Okay. But I have to work with them just to say yes. That tells me that India schools have homework to do. Homework in giving half its population a voice. You know, the nations move forward that best utilize the human potential, the intellect of their citizens. India is gifted with very bright people who have offered the world a great many um, insights and skills. They can't afford to go out into the, the 21st century without half its population. So I don't give teachers really ideas, strategies, practical ideas for how to pull out both students. They could write every student's name on a little card and just flip the cards and call on students. Forget about just calling on the students who speak, who want to speak. A teacher's role is to be intentional, to be thoughtful, and to be a teacher for all the students. So that's much of what I've seen in American schools, and I see the same thing, maybe even more severe in Indian schools. And the gender issues in Indian society, where the status of men and women are so unequal, I think is reinforced in unequal classrooms. So I ask teachers and educators to create fair classrooms, even if it's difficult. 
Often what is difficult is what is important to be learning. So that is one part of my visit here, talking to schools and students and hoping they make a difference. Another part is sharing with um, educators and with others the lessons we've learned in the States about looking for gender bias in how men and women talk in the workplace or in public. And so what I've done is I brought with me 10 questions, a gender communications quiz. And if you'd like to take the quiz with us, that would be terrific. We are going to take a quiz on um, how men and women talk differently in public settings. And let me give you a few directions. All of the, the, uh, these 10 questions were developed on research done in the United States. I met with several of my colleagues in the U.S. who are Indian, and I asked them to look at all the questions I have and to pick out just the 10 that they think apply to India. So what I could say about these questions and the answers I'm going to give you is they're true in the U.S., they may be true in India, and several Indian professors think they probably are true. I'd like you to think if they're true. And by the way, when I gave these questions to groups during this week, sometimes people get them, and sometimes they miss them completely. So let's see how you do. We're going to look at the gender communication quiz. Take these questions along with us and see how you do. These, all these questions apply to public settings. They looked at factory workers, office workers, um, people on assembly lines, teachers at meetings, and they analyzed how the males and the females differed in their treatment and in their speech. And we're going to take a look at these. Um, there are 10 questions. We're going to go through all of them together. Each one, as you see, could be marked true or false. What I'd like to do is have you take these questions in your own mind and, ask, and answer them, and then I'll tell you what the research said in the U.S. and ask you to start looking for this in India. Let's go through um, another clip, and we'll get right to our beginning again, where it says answers on the top. Stop. That's it. Men talk more than women. Do you think that's true, or do you think that's false? Well, when I gave this in my workshops in India over the last week, I have to tell you, most people say that's false. Women talk much more than men. And at the meetings, um, a lot, most people said that. And I don't know if they were thinking about at home, if they were thinking about someone in particular, a woman they know who talks a lot. But the answer according to U.S. research, and the answer according very often to my ears and eyes, is true. Men talk far more than women. In the U.S., they tied. They would do experiments where women and men would talk and they would use a clock to time it. Let me tell you about one experiment very quickly. They showed men and women paintings, and one at a time they asked them to describe the painting into a tape recorder. How long do you think the average man took to describe a painting? How long do you think the average woman took? For the average woman, it was two and a half minutes. For the average man, it was 13. Men talk far more than women. At meetings, in deliberations, at work, men talk for longer periods of time. Now, your eyes and your ears may not see this. You may be blind to this, because culture blinds us. We cannot see and tease out 
objective facts from bias culture. And very often, the culture, and I, let me tell you a little anecdote. This is a fun story. My late wife and I did a lot of television shows in America when our research first came out. And we thought when we went to the shows, how can we do this well? Or, thinking of it another way, how can we avoid making any big mistake? So we thought we were going to tell them that boys talk more than girls, that men talk more than women. If I go in and I'm talking at the interview and Myra is quiet, people will say, he didn't learn anything from his research. Talk, 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 talk. If Myra talked all the time, people would say, what are they, what are they saying? They're saying that boys talk more, men talk more, and this woman doesn't shut up. So what we had to do was take turns. Maya would answer the first question. I would answer the second question. Maya would answer the third question. I would answer the fourth question. We would work to make sure we're equitable. So on our first show, we were on for five minutes. We recorded at home the show. We played it back, and with a clock, we timed it. How long does my take? How long does that do I take? And it turned out that Myra and I spoke almost perfectly equitably. There was only nine seconds different in five minutes. What do you think most people said who saw that show? Why did Myra talk so much? Because when it's perfectly equitable to eyes comfortable with men talking most of the time, it looks as though the woman's talking too much. That's why we need to find objective tools and not depend on our biased eyes. Let's have a look at the second question. This one says, men are more likely to interrupt women than they are to interrupt men. Now, in your own mind, tell me if you think this is true or false. You have five seconds. The answer is true. Men interrupt women much more than they interrupt other men. That's one where they get to talk more, they interrupt people. But if you look closely at the research, you even realize that men and women interrupt differently. When a man interrupts someone who's talking, he redirects the conversation. He says things like, I don't know, buddy. Wait a second, I have a better story. Or, no, no, but my friend. He'll come up and try to kind of take control. When a woman interrupts, she's more likely to build on the speaker, to feed into the speaker. Um, and to agree with the speaker, she'll say, oh, yes, uh-huh, yes, oh, that happened to me. I have a friend like that. So even the nature of the interruption is different. How are you doing so far? Two questions. Do you get both right? Are you 50-50? Do you want some more to improve your score? Let's take a look at three. Question three reads, Men not only control the content of conversations, they also work harder in keeping conversations going. This one's a little more difficult because there's two parts. Men control conversations and they work harder at keeping them different, at keeping them going. What do you think? Five seconds. We never were right here on the panel. The answer is it's because the first part is true. Men do control the content of conversations. But the second part is false. Women work harder asking questions and keeping conversations going. Now, again, I'm not talking about what goes on at home with controlling conversations. But even at home, women are keeping them going. But in public settings, this is what we found in the States. Do you believe this is true in India? All I ask you to do is take a look and do it without the cultural glasses. 
Let's look at four. Question four says, when people hear generic words such as mankind and he, they respond inclusively, indicating that the word applies to both sexes. Do you think that's true or false? Do you think words like mankind, people image applying to both men and women, or do you think that's false? We have the answer, which is false. When people hear words such as mankind and he, at one level they know it's supposed to include everybody, but in their mind they see men. I'll give you one quick example. Um, people in their 30s were asked to design, to just stretch out a book cover. One group was told the title of the book is Urban Man. Stretch out a cover idea for us. Another group was told the title of the book is Urban Life. Stretch out a cover. I think you know where I'm going. The group that had the directions to draw a cover for Urban Man at some level, they knew that urban man was kind of a broad term, but their covers are only urban men. The group that was told to draw a cover for urban life had men and women and children. Words are very careful. I ask teachers, and I also ask employers to think carefully about the words they use because they mean a lot. Try to use words that don't have one gender exclusively in them. Let's take a look at the next question. Question number five, I guess. Male students receive more reprimands and criticisms than female students. Now you're looking at a classroom. And we see that the answer is true. And I'm going to have to recommend someone for that. Um, males are punished more publicly and more harshly than females. By the way, males have a stereotype too. Being troublemakers, they don't have a burden too. Making most of the money in the family. And as India moves towards looking at gender issues, they will come to realize what America is realizing that there are at least two genders. And that when you open opportunities for women, you actually open opportunities for men too. Men who are now to be parents and active parents at home. Men who maybe don't have to take the full burden of earning a salary to support a family, but could partner with a woman. Men who don't have to hide and close their emotions. Men who don't have to die years earlier than women because of the stress of their role. Gender bias puts a straitjacket and a box on both men and women. Let's take a look at the next question. Women use less personal space than men. Do you think that's true? Or do you think that's false? The space around you, the personal space. And the answer? It is true. Women use less personal space. Did you ever go to a lobby or a public place, maybe an airport, a bus terminal, someplace, and you see women and men sitting together? You see the women sitting closer. And you'll see the men stretched out. Men take up more space, women take less space. What does it mean if you took up more space? Why is it important if males talk more than females? Why does it matter if one gender interrupts more than the other? It matters because those are all signs of silent entitlement, of special privilege, of power that is 
invisible until you begin talking about it. I hope as we go through the quiz, you'll begin talking about it. Let's take a look at the next question. When a man uh, speaks, he is listened to more carefully than a female speaker, even when he makes the identical presentation. So a man's voice, a man's work, carries more power than a female speaker. Do you believe that's true? Let's take a look. It is true. It's called the devaluation of, wi- of women, and you find it across society. Let's look at the next question. Women speak in a more tentative style than men. What do you think? Tentative, that means asking questions, sounding less sure of themselves, less likely to give an order. What do you think? Four thoughts. Let's take a look. You were doing well until then. <laughs> Women do speak in a more tentative style. And a man comes into a room and he says, it's hot in here. A woman comes into a room and says, is it hot in here? Are you hot? Much more tentative. Let's look at the next question. We're going to look at the next question. Here we go. Uh, women are more likely to answer questions not addressed to them. Um, women are more likely to answer questions that are not addressed to them. So someone's asking a question, and a woman votes right in and answers it. You think that's true? Or thoughts? Well, if you pick thoughts, you are correct. Men answer questions not addressed to them. That's why they get to talk so much. Let me give you an example. An Indian man and woman go into an office, they're being interviewed by someone, maybe a, a school official, and the school official will say, looking at the woman, how many children do you have? And the husband would say, we have a few children. 10, 12, and 13. Their names are Men do that much more than women. We have one more question. I hope your score is pretty good. The last question reads, there is widespread sex segregation in schools, and it hinders effective communication, effective learning, if that's kind of what it is. And there we go. I really started the talk with this one, so I'm trying to see if you remember from the first question to the last. And the answer is true. And as I said, when, when you segregate, teachers end up with the boys in the class, not the girls. How did you do on your quiz? I hope you did pretty well, but more importantly, I hope the quiz helps you begin looking a gender bias in your own life, starting in your own family, starting in your own school, because when your behavior is at home and your behavior is at work, when you're looking for equity, you will find a more complete and wholesome life, one in which male and female work together as equals. When they work separately, there's always pressure, there's always oppression, both the oppressor and the oppressed feel the weight of that. I'd like to end with one quote, if I might. Um, we can do just the first one. And this is a message from me to you. And if we can put it on the screen. Well, I could read it too. Never doubt. A 
Okay, I think we have it now. There we go. I like this quote, and I hope you do too. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead was a, a famous anthropologist. I hope you will become part of that small group of thoughtful, committed citizens changing your world. And I appreciate your hospitality uh, in my trips throughout your country. And um, I've learned a lot. And I hope I'm teaching some people as well. Thank you. Particularly for the new of the dragon of what we know today as feminism and yet waiting for a pass. That's the, uh, that's on, on which the fate of humanity is particularly in a democratic way. Uh, what uh, one would appreciate in the course of this talk is that he is relating this sexism in, in a classroom in an education system with what one can now say gender apartheid. And uh, it is as serious as that. In our situation, we often say that we consider women as goddesses, but uh, we must allow these goddesses to speak, we must allow them to have their proper space in society, in, in the different spheres of our society where in very, very delay. You would have also noticed that uh, he literally has said is a uh, very pragmatic. Are very practical and they're very practicable also, uh, particularly in, in, in our classrooms and so on. And uh, in a very mild way, putting uh, needs where it, it really matters. And uh, I remember when a uh, student at Eastern Downs for me, one of our professors used to say that when you go in, then they, there will be one goal. Uh, standing outside the classroom with folded hands, a couple of books in a name, and then uh, all boys would be inside. She would wait for the professor, and when the professor would go in, then she would uh, go to the class, into the classroom. He said that <coughs> now the situation has come, and uh, hopefully for that, but after some time, boys would stand like that girl. And the girls would go inside, and the girls would go for the teachers so that they could go inside. That's not the situation that was in very later time, but the fact is that uh, both should have uh, equal space, equitable opportunities, uh, and social, economic, and cultural development. Um, this particular trip and this particular talk set could both certainly help. I spend some time on uh, solving on this particular thing. In our open university system, by the way, we do not come in direct touch with students. We, we get in touch with them through our counselors. Yes. And uh, most of the counselors happen to be male. So there is, in fact, greater opportunity to have this kind of discrimination. That's because uh, it is uh, at the study centers. And uh, we supply study materials, printed study materials, and we uh, say, uh, classic CDs and live telecasts. Uh, perhaps after this step, we will have to think of new, new ways uh, of uh, sensitizing our students, our counselors, and uh, mm, I've worked in America, one of the professors, uh, he said that in the picture of the pilot, the only project. So it's that time, so that, uh, that family is punished to be restored, so that uh, the, the women, uh, whether they are in the university system, working as employees, or uh, as servants, they can speak. And uh, something that we very really rightly said, that uh, boys are the male child make use of their ears more than their tongues. It was an Indian uh, civilization and culture. There is a term called uh, Bhashat. Eh? 
to be a blessed person is one who helps more than he, he talks. So I think the message for them is that nature that's spoken on it. <laughs> they should listen more and the domestic and the creative opportunities in which they are living in a good and equal space. I think uh, we have come a long way from 1792 when Mary Wistencroft wrote that vindication of rights of women because uh, one of the ways to empower women is moving on to the class because this is the best possible space. If she gets discriminated, if women get discriminated in the classroom, how can we think that they would get their equitable space in villages where they are in many ways dependent on and, 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 uh, and that, uh, what we have, like we rightly said, that uh, we don't focus in a lot of Python in our, our, our uh, this uh, uh, front part of in 21st century, the AD, or maybe 15th, 16th, you never know, not in different parts. In villages, what one feels is that at some level, there is greater discrimination at some level. Women have you know, more powerful space. They control the things. And uh, you know, we are part of a matriarchal society, say, for instance, in Kerala and Northeast, where all these things are changing very fast. And uh, you want to learn a lot from your experience and uh, implement it. Uh, perhaps uh, um, to get democracy in the world. Have to think of this question together and uh, move towards a mutual, uh, mutual and distinct experience in this particular direction. Um, I would uh, take this opportunity to thank American Center in particular, Kasneel uh, uh, Kalsaka, yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, mm, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Sakka, because I never thought that. Such a talk and a topic like this can be so much free from economy, <laughs> can be so interesting, and can be so practical for, our, uh, for, our, for us in particular. I believe uh, this uh, interaction, this dialogue that is begun today with uh, the, the ESOFI or the United States American Center, this would grow, and uh, we would be happier to have more such interactions because it opens up altogether a new world. Uh, perhaps tomorrow we will have more interaction uh, when we have this uh, seminar and discussion. Here, uh, if you permit, uh, we can uh, thank the Sutka and, uh, and uh, Perhaps we would go to say last word I to our viewers. Uh, yeah, so this should be the last word. To comprise, I mean, uh, we will have, uh, we have our uh, viewers, uh, including uh, educators as well as students. Yes. So, would you want to say... Educators, uh, counselors, students, all over the state. How they can together make yes. the society it's more sustainable. And you should have the last word in the last year. Yes. I think the other side, um, I think each person, and I think I'm not alone on this, each person is sacred, and each person has value. And I think people in education know this in their mind and in their heart. But I think what they need to do is make sure their behaviors reflect that. Counselors, students, and teachers could look at this as an opportunity to grow in their own work. I have found that equitable teachers equitable counselors are effective counselors. One of the foundations of being effective in a classroom or in a counseling setting is being fair and equitable with each student and each person. So I encourage you to do this. It is not easy, but it is very worth it. Um, I'm reminded of an anthropologist who said, if fish were anthropologists, the last thing they would discover would be water. Sexism is like a sea that surrounds us. And too often, it's the last water that we recognize. 
So I ask you to begin looking for it and in a constructive and cooperative way, come up with ways to get rid of sexism and create more equitable education environments. Thank you. Thank you again, and we should be for being so kind and being the best of us. Thank you. I'm going to go and join the session today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.